Who do you think was the first president to witness human flight? Wilson, Grant, Franklin Pierce. Did you know he was president? It was actually this guy. On January 19th, 1793, Washington observed French aeronaut Jean-Pierre Francois Blanchard take to the sky above the Walnut Street prison in Philadelphia in a hot air balloon. So we've been doing this a while. Incidentally, the first U.S. president to actually fly was Teddy Roosevelt. On October 11, 1910, he was speaking in St. Louis when he was approached by Arch Hoxie. Hoxie had been hired by the Wright brothers to travel the country and drum up interest in their new airplane. The 26-year-old, who'd only been flying for seven months, convinced Roosevelt to join him on a short joyride. As Roosevelt put it, Unfortunately for Hoxie, the joyride ended two months later. He was performing for another crowd in Los Angeles when, for unknown reasons, his plane took a nosedive at 7,000 feet. The telegram back to the Wright brothers was three sentences long. After making sure to mention the profits earned that day, it said simply that Hoxie would be cremated at 2.30 the following afternoon. The early days of flight were dangerous. Remember John Pierre Blanchard? He suffered a heart attack during the flight, fell from the balloon, and died of his injuries. Incidentally, the first balloon, like the first airplane, was the creation of a pair of brothers, Jacques and Joseph Montgolfier. And I suppose, in a very, very small way, you could say George Washington unintentionally played a part in the balloon's creation. That's because when the American colonies convinced France to ally with them in the Revolutionary War, France used the alliance as an excuse to target valuable British territories like Gibraltar on the Spanish coast. The siege of Gibraltar was the longest in history and continued two years after the Revolutionary War ended, but the French couldn't seem to find a way past the walls of Gibraltar. And a thousand kilometers away, in the town of Avignon, a papermaker found himself daydreaming about the problem while he tended to a fire. As Joseph Montgolfier watched the rising heat, he pictured a flying machine carried on currents of hot air able to deliver French troops over the fortress. After some experiments with box kites and cloth balloons, he convinced his brother Jacques that they could build one large enough to carry people. A little over a year later, the brothers were invited to Versailles to launch their balloon before the last king and queen of France. The brothers chose to send a duck, a rooster, and a sheep for the royal occasion. After about 10 minutes, all three landed unharmed. Emboldened, the brothers spent the next several months building a balloon big enough to carry humans and sent two men into the air before a fire forced them to land. One of the passengers was this guy. Jean-Francois Piletri de Rosé was one of the first people to fly, and despite that fire on his first voyage, he volunteered to do it again. In 1785, he tried to cross the English Channel in a new hydrogen air hybrid. This didn't go as well, and the balloon exploded, making one of the first people to fly the first aircraft fatality. Someone did manage to cross the English Channel that same year. This guy. Blanchard was joined by co-pilot Dr. John Jeffries. Unsure what kind of gases awaited them in the upper atmosphere, they brought silk oars in case the air was thick enough for them to row across the sky. However, within a few hours, the balloon was barely staying afloat, and descending so close to the water they were in danger of sinking. The oars were thrown overboard, and so was anything else that added extra weight, including Blanchard's pants. When that wasn't enough, Jeffrey suggested they pee over the side to see if emptying their bladders might help. When he later published this account, Jeffries called the idea ludicrous, but possibly life-saving. Then, Blanchard still died in a balloon a few years later. This kind of pants-dropping, death-defying lifestyle attracted a new breed of daredevil and romantic. People like Pierre Tetsu Brissy, who made 50 flights on horseback, and flew into thunderstorms holding an electrical rod, trying to observe lightning firsthand. Or Sophie Blanchard, who donned colorful costumes and flew through the skies of Paris in a silver cradle. Napoleon made her an official aeronaut of France, and on national holidays she would delight crowds by sailing overhead and launching fireworks. This was not smart, and in 1819 she set her own balloon on fire and fell to her death. A tragedy, but maybe not an unforeseen one, given that she'd been married to this guy. John Wise, on the other hand, sometimes called the first American aeronaut, fared better. Flying in balloons of his own design, he would amaze crowds by dropping dogs in homemade parachutes. Unlike some of his contemporaries, Wise made over 400 flights without issue and lived a long, healthy life. Until the age of 71, when his balloon disappeared in a windstorm and he was never seen again. You might not feel so bad about that, 
because of the dog thing. But in his defense, he was only copying an act first started by this guy. As far as I can tell, it was lucky timing for the Montgolfier brothers that the same year they began building their balloon, another French inventor had an idea for the parachute. Sebastien Lenormand didn't make the parachute anticipating his countrymen would soon make a habit of throwing pets from airships. He made it to help people who might find themselves trapped on a rooftop during a fire. He called it para, or Latin for resist, and shoot, French for fall. In 1783, he gave a personal demonstration by jumping off an observatory tower. Joseph Montgolfier was watching in the crowd. The parachute worked, and the new class of aeronaut enthusiasts began experimenting with ways to make it a more fitting companion for the balloon. For example, Robert Cocking, a painter and amateur balloonist, envisioned this conical design. He also decided to test his invention personally. And in 1837, Robert Cocking became the first person to die in a parachute accident. Over 75 years later in 1914, when the first aerial combat was beginning over the skies of Europe, there was still no reliable way for pilots to escape a falling aircraft. That's why the US military had invited Tiny and Charles Broadwick to make several jumps over a base in San Diego to demonstrate their new life preserver of the sky. Born Georgia Ann Thompson, Tiny was a 15-year-old single mother working long hours in a North Carolina cotton mill when she first saw a performance by Charles Broadwick and his traveling family of famous French aeronauts. Instantly enamored, Georgia Ann quit her job, left her daughter with her parents, and joined Broadwick's troop, who renamed her Tiny, the child aeronaut. After a decade of jumping, Charles Broadwick modified the silk parachute he and Tiny used for balloons to work for the newly invented airplane. The idea was to put a seat next to the fuselage, a pilot could climb out, strap on a parachute, and jump. A rope fastened to the plane would pull tight and rip the pack open. Tiny made three successful jumps before military officials, but on her fourth, something went wrong and the rope became tangled. Rather than cancel the demonstration, she cut the line and began free falling back to earth before grabbing the leftover cord and opening the chute herself. In a moment of desperate ingenuity, Tiny Broadwick invented skydiving and the rip cord. Incidentally, if you want to know who survived the longest fall without a parachute, it's Vesna Voljevic. In 1973, she was a 23-year-old flight attendant aboard a Yugoslav DC-9 when it exploded en route to Copenhagen. Voljevic fell 10 kilometers, the cruising altitude of most airplanes. She suffered numerous broken bones, crushed vertebrae, and was initially paralyzed, but eventually made a full recovery and lived another 40 years. The record for the highest freefall with the parachute was Felix Baumgartner in 2012. He jumped from the stratosphere 37 kilometers above the earth, and he got there in a balloon. Joseph Montgolfier had first imagined balloons carrying French soldiers over the rocks of Gibraltar. But a hundred years later, it was the French who found themselves using balloons to try and escape an invading force. In 1870, Paris was under siege with no way to reach the outside world. Balloonists made over 60 flights across enemy lines to deliver messages, drop leaflets, and even smuggle out their minister of war. The author Victor Hugo, who had to resort to eating animals from the city zoo to survive, made this sketch of one such flight. No doubt hopeful it would return with reinforcements and fresh supplies. Two of the pilots who flew for this flying French force were a pair of brothers, Albert and Gaston Tissandé. Gaston was a landscape painter who tried to capture the experience of his trips among the clouds. He wrote, no poet has ever dreamed of such a brilliantly radiating spectacle, nor imagined such dazzling lines of fire. His brother Albert dreamed of flying higher than anyone, and in 1875 he attempted to break the world record. He was joined by two scientists who wanted to measure oxygen levels in the upper atmosphere. At eight and a half kilometers, Albert passed out. When he came to, he found his two companions suffocated to death and his balloon plummeting to the ground. He survived the crash, kept flying, and eventually the two brothers would go on to create the first electric-powered balloon. S.A. Andre, Knut Frankel, and Nils Strindberg were three Swedish explorers intent on breaking a record of their own. In 1897, they set out to be the first explorers to reach the North Pole. In a balloon laden with cameras and special equipment, Andre planned to steer them to the Arctic using a revolutionary navigation system. Unfortunately, this system was mostly fueled by Andre's optimism and not actual science. He also didn't take any test flights before embarking, which might have revealed several of the leaks that dragged his crew down onto a giant ice floe. They survived the landing, the balloon did not. From July until September, they trekked across the ice, living off steel and polar bears, towing a sled with their remaining supplies. Worsening weather forced them to build a makeshift camp and wait for rescue. 
it would be 29 years before someone finally succeeded. In 1926, Roald Amundsen, who had already planted Norway's flag on the South Pole, made plans to journey to the North Pole with Italian pilot Umberto Nobile, who designed and piloted their ship the Norge, a balloon. The ship safely circled the North Pole and finished its journey in Alaska. And in 1928, Umberto Nobile built a second ship, the Italia, for a return voyage. The Italia made it to the pole, but on its way home, high winds blew the airship off course and ice began forming on the propellers. After an hour of struggling to gain control, Nobile ordered the engines cut, knowing a crash was imminent. When the Italia did crash, the cabin was smashed to pieces and nine of the men were sent tumbling onto the ice. Once free from the weight of the cabin, the balloon began rising again, carrying the remaining six crew members back into the air. Natale Sicione, the chief technician, whose legs were broken when he hit the ground, recalled the look of horror on the face of the men still on board as they realized what was happening. The landlocked survivors were able to salvage a radio and silk tent and transmit a distress signal. While they awaited rescue, they dined on seal and polar bear. Roald Amundsen, Nobile's partner from the first North Pole expedition, immediately formed a search party. His plane disappeared en route to the Arctic, and he was never seen again, and neither was the floating wreckage of the Italia or the six men still on it. Of the nine men stranded on the ice, seven survived. Roughly a year later, the Norwegian boat, the Bratvag, was sailing through the Arctic when they discovered the remains of two skeletons, a diary, and several photographic plates. This was the final resting place of S.A. Andre's original Arctic expedition. Those would be aeronauts' fate had been a mystery for 33 years, and the men had documented their own slow demise. For an instant, the Norge seemed to herald a new era for balloons. Instead, the Italia foreshadowed a series of tragedies that effectively ended the age of the balloon forever. It's easy to compare these stories to Icarus. These people literally flew too high, often powered by nothing more than hubris, and many met the same fate. But the myth of Icarus never sat well with me. What is the moral really supposed to be? Stay in your lane? Read the warning label before use? Dream, just not too big? Icarus fails and dies, but he proves to the world we can fly. Once people know that, somebody's going to try again. Whatever its failures, the hot air balloon succeeded in creating a generation of dreamers. Edgar Allan Poe once wrote a story about a man who flew to the moon in a balloon. It's naive and silly, and he meets moon people. But it inspired Jules Verne to write From the Earth to the Moon, the first story to describe a rocket in space. And a hundred years later, Neil Armstrong gave thanks to that book as the Apollo 11 crew returned home. So a better moral might be, the only way any of us will see what's beyond the horizon is for a few of us to be willing to fly too high, unafraid of what happens when we fail. Also, dress warmly, be kind to dogs, and use the bathroom before you go. <laughs>